Anyways, besides all of that, I think we're pretty much ready to get started. So without further ado, uh, so welcome James Abel and Francois Pignuel. I'm working on that. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Thanks for everybody for coming. And um, yeah, this is like the number 10th finance. Well, you know, there, there are the two hardest problems in software are naming, testing, and off by one errors. So this is 10. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but don't put on. It's a tough crowd. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to talk about is um, something you've probably seen in the news, uh, Meltdown, Spectra. I call it for Python programmers, although this is the only slide that has Python on it. <laughs> so it's for all programmers. We all live in, in harmony. And luckily, and Francois Piedno here, I've worked with him on and off for, well, I don't know, 20, 15, 20 years or something at Intel doing enabling and software optimizations and things. So this is, I, I'm going to do the fluffy overview and he's going to talk about the real serious technical stuff. And uh, yeah, I probably should have put this up. So here's uh, us, uh, Francois. I mean, we're both former principal engineers at Intel. Uh, both of us are no longer there. He's an AI architect. He gets to have a lot of fun. I'm a consultant now in, the, in biotech, as it turned out, which was sort of almost by accident. And we've done a lot of nerd stuff over the years. But what you really want to talk um, hear about is this crazy thing called Meltdown and Spectra. And there are actually two kinds of different attacks that kind of came out together. Um, and I don't know who's running PR for bugs these days, but this is like amazing PR. They've got better logos than I've ever had. <laughs> I, they must be hiring firms out of New York. But anyway... Uh, so meltdown. Um, there's a couple. We're going into some details here, but just at a high level, these things are like, or we call a side channel attacks. Is kind of one of the, the names for them. And meltdown um, is is basically a way to get into the kernel memory, which you're not supposed to be able to get into, uh, from a regular user space. And spectra, they, they, you melt down the 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 wall between you and where you're not supposed to be. And Spectra is around speculative execution. Um, and this is uh, basically taking advantage of some, um, you know, speculation to improve performance. It's put into the processors to trick the processors into executing uh, instructions and giving access to things you shouldn't have been able to do. And you're like, well, wait a minute. I took computer science class and they told us this stuff would never happen. Well, what they, what they told us in school was that everything was great. Right, we've got, um, you know, basically, if you're on a computer and you've got two applications, you've got a memory management unit, you've got separate registers, you've got this big wall between them, they won't access each other, and everything should probably be okay, right? Well, yeah, that makes sense. And then, you know, even with uh, virtualization, if you're out in the cloud and you're running on some computer, and as you can see with his shirt, he says, there is no cloud, it's just somebody else's computer. And so if you're on somebody else's computer and you're running next to somebody else's code, it's totally fine, right? You're on a virtualization, you got a hypervisor, they're keeping everything separate, the memories, um, um, you know, memories are separate. And so you can't access the stuff, right? Well, that was the thought. Well, but there are side channel attacks. So there's been a lot of, there's, side channel attacks are basically a microarchitectural um, uh, issue, right, is that, so, you know, I, what I was just talking about was the computer architecture. It's in the software developer's manual. It's what you're taught in school. The reality of the world is the microarchitecture. Um, and side channel attacks are things that are in the system that um, you don't really see the bits as you program them. Caches, for example, right? You don't really program caches. You don't, there's no cache or register that you see that you, you work with. But yet they're there. And what these side channel attacks do are, are take advantage of things like that. And that they are actually shared among the programs you run on your computer, whether it's another, whether it's the browser in your application or two browsers or different tabs in the browsers to two different sites, or if you're in the cloud, somebody else's program, you don't know if they're a nice person or not, um, running on the same computer that you are. And so what will happen is some of these accesses and these speculative executions, if you are really, 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 really tricky about it, 
then you can figure out how to access things you normally couldn't. Now, I'd say tricky. These are taking advantage, th these issues, Spectre and Meltdown, are taking advantage of things that have been in the processors for years and years and years. And then, um, uh, I won't go that one yet. Uh, it took a people a really long time to figure out how to use them, um, kind of discover them and use them. So it's relatively complicated. And we're not going to be able to get to every single aspect of this in 15 minutes, but we're going to kind of uh, hit the highlights here. And so why do these things happen? Why would we ever put ourselves into such peril? The reason is we want better performance. Everybody wants their programs to run faster. And so um, one, one thing that's taken advantage of generally is speculative execution, where, and if you don't know this, that when you're running a, a, in any processor, it's making guesses as to what's going to happen next. If you just if you access this memory location, then one after the one after it says, "Oh, wait a minute, you might be accessing the one after that," and it will start executing those things. Same for instructions. Um, so, speculative execution, uh, you uh, avoid dependent stalls. And stalls meaning the processor isn't doing anything; it's waiting for something. Um, but these um, these attacks that we're talking about take advantage of those things. Now, like I said, it does actually have to, um, the, the code does have to be on the system. Um, and there's a couple of different methods here, and, and Francois is going to go over that. Uh, luckily, in general, there's some software patches that have, have been created by operating system vendors, by br uh, browser creators, et cetera. And uh, so you don't have to throw out all your computers. You can actually run them, and, but things will tend to slow down once these patches have been put in. So, but next up into the details, uh, Francois is going to actually explain the technical details of how these things work. Yoo-hoo. So first, excuse my French. That's, if you don't understand me, that's normal. Uh, so basically, we're going to look two minutes about what is a speculative execution. Uh, obviously, uh, here you can see that Z is depending on Y. And if you have a, a piece of code that does this into a loop, after a while, the processor is going to be smart enough to say, hey, I can figure out the result of this before actually I get here. So that's the entire idea that you can get a little bit ahead and you can remove dependencies into your code. So that makes your processor really fast since the Pentium Pro. Uh, I was not working for Intel yet. Well, that was one <laughs> Pentium Pro. That was that was like Pentium two time frame ish. So Pentium yeah, that, three. Yeah. That's a long time ago. Long time ago. <laughs> uh, then the attack of Spectre is kind of uh, it assumes that you're going to take a piece of code, you're going to access a piece of memory, which is this one here, and when you run this into a loop, you will actually compare. But while you're comparing this, you will fetch this result. And you train your processor a little bit. And after a few loops, like a thousand loops, you just basically introduce something in X that is not the right value. You go and say, go and fetch it really far. And when you go and fetch it really far, up, up, you end up with uh, a piece of memory that you don't own, that is somewhere outside your uh, your process, but it's no, it's, it's inside your process, but it's uh, not inside your thread, for example. So you can end up grabbing uh, with a JavaScript. The, the address of the stack and then recover the password being typed into another HTML page. So that's the basics of Spectre. It's basically you try to catch a wrong value of X and then you use another thread because you have hyper threading. So hyper threading lets you actually have the same cache shared between two processes. So the second processor, second, sorry, logical processor can go and grab the information before the processor decides that you should not have it. That's the idea. So you have a very small window of time where you can go and grab the information. 
And then you can start logging password on Chrome, for example, all those kind of things. By the way, there's a good patch for Chrome. So take it very quick, OK? Um, what spec doesn't do, it doesn't allow you to go and fetch in the secure space. So if you are Chrome here, for example, and you have your, your key stored for the password for the website, you can access it. But you can't go and steal uh, RSA keys of your operating system or all those kind of things. So it's bad, but it's not that bad. Uh, then you have the fact that uh, it goes through across virtual machines. Don't ask me how. I still, I'm still digging on it. The bug is filed, and they reported that it is doing this. Uh, I'm sure there's people at Intel that know, but I left, so I didn't get the answer yet. Um, so that's packed. Now, Meltdown. Meltdown is a little bit more tricky. It's only on Intel. And it can access secret of the operating system. Uh, so one of the good news about the operating system, they trend not to store their very critical information at the same place every time you reboot. So Windows is very, very good at this. You know, like uh, what we call the global that, uh, descriptor table where you store all of the information for your threads. This table is moved all the time in Windows. Even when you close the lid of your laptop and reopen, it's moved. Linux, not so much. Mac OS, not so much. <laughs> but it's hard to find. You have a, if you look at the amount of space you have to start scanning into the kernel mode, you need to take quite some time. Uh, my estimate that it would take about 20 minutes if you want to scan fully something, uh, this, this space on, on, a, on Linux. So the way it works is you take a piece of memory, 4K, for kilobyte, and you go and you flush it to memory. So you force it. We have instructions that you can send, and it basically forced to be un uncached. Okay. Then you go and try to read the thing you should not be reading. The processor, in his great witness uh, wisdom, sorry, will think, uh oh. You should not be doing this. So it's going to block you. It's going to generate exception. But you design your program, you handle the exception, and you keep going. OK? That's not supposed to give you anything in theory. In practice, if you write a loop and you pay attention to how fast you read each block of memory here, and you, you try to read them per cache line, so you, you take the RDTC timer of the processor. You say, oh, this is my tick. I read. I take the tick again. And when you see this number increasing, you know you just read something that was cached. And, and by the way, those we're talking about the read timestamp counter, which is the speed of the processor clock. Yes. So we're talking about, you know, RDTC is a gigahertz, uh, two gigahertz, three gigahertz type. Uh, it's a speed. tick tock machine. It's a tick, 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 tick. Uh, a TikTok machine is broken. Uh, <laughs> some got the joke. OK. Uh, so in fact, you, you see two letters here that are in red. It's because you will not get a lot of those things that the processor is going to let you have. So you need to be stubborn. You need to keep looping, looping again. We try to read again, flush your cache. And then if you do this, after a while, you start getting some pretty good idea of what's happening into the kernel secrets. So now the sum of all fears. Recently, if you dig into the hacker areas of the internet, they figure out one thing. Since the 386, we have those two tables, the global descriptor table and the local descriptor table. This one helps you to figure out where are your process. And this, each process in Windows has one, or in Linux, you have one. This is a preemptive mechanism that is uh, out there since 386. And basically, if you get this, you get the stack, you get the heap, Christmas, but not in December. 
So they are trying really hard. There's no proof of concept for this, but I can see them being very active at getting this. So please, what you got to do is patch as much as you can. Now we're going to go through performance. You want to take it? No, I don't care. Okay, okay, do it. Do it. Okay, so I used to be a performance engineer at Intel. So uh, performance-wise, uh, you're putting fences into your operating system to try to avoid this. So one very important thing to understand, those patch are going to, to try to mediate the problem. They are not going to fix the problem. Okay, so basically the operating system vendors other compiler vendors, I heard there's some in the room for uh, the Python on time uh, compiler. Uh, you got to take measure to go and fix this. And so those measures are going to cost you from nothing. So for example, if you're running a 3D rendering, that's going to cost you peanuts, zero. If you spend your life going into the system, every time you get into the system, you're going to hit the fence. New things like they go and flush the cache, or they try to figure out what is the status of the cache, or they, they do additional work when you call the system, and that's going to cost you performance. So there is some benchmarks that show if you test the, the hard drive, for example, you basically system bound it. You call Windows all the time, or you call Linux all the time. And when you do this, that costs you 20%. So it's between zero. 20, and if you really want to, if you want it to be a very bad news, and you know, there's always people out there that try to present it in the worst possible light, uh, you can write a benchmark that would make it look two times slower. It's up to what you actually do in your system call and what you do into your workload. So that can look really bad. But in fact, if you look at most of the usage model that people are doing every day, it's not that bad. Uh, Meltdown, yeah, Mongo. Hmm. I'm not an expert into this one. Yeah, just one, one example. Okay. But yeah. In general, I mean, I, I, we tried to scour the internet, and you know, we kind of saw the zero to twenty percent a lot, sometimes thirty, sometimes forty. So that's you know, it's a ballpark of what we're looking at from as far as slowdowns go. And then summary: patch, patch, and patch. <laughs> Please don't do that to yourself. Yeah. yeah. And, and like this, you know, this is the operating system. Uh, We've been talking about browsers because a lot of people store their passwords in the browser. If you notice, like Chrome, Firefox have had updates. So, you know, it isn't just the operating system. If you have a compiler, make sure you do something about your compiler. Uh, there's actually a mediation, uh, Intel. They did release an a new kind of instruction that they call uh, red pulling. Red pulling. So it's a mix between a return and a trampoline, <laughs> and it helps you to rebound properly on your problem. So you know, if you if you are working on a compiler, please Google this and go for it. It's it's really important that everybody gets yeah. there. I'll go back up a second. This is yep. this is my other thing. <laughs> um. Yeah, so the other thing I can say, I think that, um, you know, as these things go, is that first software patches have come out, hardware mitigations, uh, my, some of it can be done in microcode, which you sometimes can uh, update through your BIOS. There's rumors that operating systems might be starting to update microcode, but I don't think that that's commonplace yet. So you might have to actually, like, if you want to do a BIOS up, up, update on your uh, motherboard. So... You know, I would imagine, I don't know if this is the case, but if you're like Amazon, yeah, you have access to all that stuff. So they might, they can update microcode, um, which is a good thing. So I think this has got a lot of attention. I feel like it's Y2K, you know, it's like, oh no, you know, the nuclear reactors are going to melt down and, you know, it's gonna melt down again. You know, nuclear reactors are going to melt down and we're all going to die. And then it came down that a couple of taxis in Tokyo went the wrong direction. So, you know, hopefully it got enough attention um that that it actually isn't like the most horrible thing in the world but you know got to update all the stuff up patch all the things um and i think that and oh yeah there's no no successful attacks that i've seen at least i've heard about i keep, I keep looking on the internet i don't know has anybody heard of a successful attack no 
it's kind of like Y2K all over again. And keep in mind that most of the attacks, they have to be able to run code on your machine. Like a virus, right? So he's already in. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, if you, if you got a, a regular laptop. Level. So if yeah. you are in this shape, you're already in a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> And then the only other thing I can say is, uh, just in summary, this has nothing to do with this talk, but if you like to talk or you're like me or you like Francois, you like his accent, um, we talk a lot about packaging and usage models. Um, you know, I know that um, Amun has, has, has talked about packaging and the packaging gradient many times. I've got three questions I'd like to ask you, and if you want to answer me, go to my, that's my website, so I've, I've aliased this over to a survey monkey. So if you go to able.co, which is my website, uh, dot slash ps, and answer a few questions. Only three questions, but it'll it'll ask you about oh you know what um, what are your targets and operating systems and stuff. So if you wouldn't mind going up there and answering three questions, that would be great. So sorry, that was just an interjection there. Nothing to do with the talk. And we made it in time. Did we make it in time? I think yeah. so. No yeah. way. Yeah, pretty much. So we'll be, we'll be at the end over there. You know, if you have questions yeah. on, well, any on question? the wiring of the, the yeah, we'll definitely be around. But any questions, like right off the bat, yeah. Um, you guys said that Meltdown only affects Intel architectures, is that right? Yep, that's all we Why know about so far. doesn't it affect AMD? Ah, that's a question I use not to be able to answer. <laughs> uh, they just use a different uh, speculative mechanism for loading and storing. But they say they're not touched, but they still release a patch. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thought, yeah. Um, I don't think there's anything like inherent. I mean, the fact that you like, you know, your corporate headquarters and extra fries in Sunnyvale, it makes a difference. But it just so happened that the, the, the decisions they made apparently don't expose them to that as much. Yeah, and, and uh, Intel has a very aggressive uh, memory subsystem. Yeah. And a fabric that is a lot more complicated. So you have a, uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, so AMD call it hyper transport, and we call it uh, QPI. So they have. Yeah. And, and this fabric maintains memory coherency and a lot of things that yeah. probably is involved into the problem. Yeah. Another question over there? Um, so this is perfect. As guys who uh, worked at Intel, uh, you can answer something I've been, well, maybe answer something I've been wondering, which is how much do you think this is sort of thrown off Intel's, well, and, and AMD's development pipeline? Like, uh, they have to rethink a whole lot of techniques they were using, right? Uh, yeah, how, how much, so the, yeah, how much is it screwing up Intel? You know, it's not that bad. I mean, for one thing, it's like, you look at this and the stock tanked like the next day when this came out, but now it's at a, it's up at 50, which it hasn't been here in a really long time. So if you know... No such thing as bad publicity. <clears throat> so anyway, so that's just... that's. It. But so, anyway, but it actually, to answer your question is, this kind of stuff happens at Intel all the time. Now, maybe not this magnitude, but, you know, things happen and they get mitigated. And usually people, if it's something that can be, like, fixed uh, quickly... And we do, and Intel did its job right. You don't really hear about it, right? All these little nerds scurry around and fix stuff, and then the outside world just doesn't really get exposed to stuff. This one was bigger than that. Um, I think it was made known to Intel what middle of last year, summer last year or something. I was still walking there. No comment. Yeah, you weren't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, that that's what I. And so I haven't been at Intel for a year and a half, so I don't really know exactly. So I wasn't like part of it when it when it came down, but. These things happen, and I don't really think it's that big of a deal. So the Intel and the the way they design processors, it's just another thing. The, w the way I look at it is it was a progress into the science of computer science. So nobody understood this mechanism, the, the side effect of it, before it actually got exposed. As soon as you know about it, I know how to fix it. Yeah, so it, Obviously, the next processor, trust me, they're not going to have anything like this. Uh, but you know, the entire science didn't know about it. It's like a discovery for computer architecture. Meltdown is a different problem. Spectre, for sure, is a new computer science understanding. And it's just one more thing to take care of. Uh, the, the way I explain the thing, a processor at Intel is between 5 to 10 billion transistors. 
in magnitude of complexity with a space shuttle, used to be pretty cool, it's about a thousand times. So when they simulate, when they work on all of those kind of things, you got to have little accident like this. Here, it was further than just the little architecture accident. That was an understanding of the computer science not being deep enough on the specific problem of speculation. So if you take it back, you can fix it, and nobody will ever hear about it again except all of the people that have those computers in the past. Well. Pretty good answer to me. So yeah, I mean, uh, thank you very much, James and Francois. If you want to ask questions, they will be taking them after they said. Yeah, thanks. If you want to speculate on the speculation. Yeah. All right. Very good. I'm I'm pretty sure you're just downplaying this because you want us to visit this website so you can use Rohammer.js to get all of our passwords. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> what you weren't supposed to say. <laughs> you said there's no there's no successful attack. You just want to be the first. Yeah. All right. It hasn't been up until now. <laughs> just wait. All right. All right. <laughs>